So, hello everyone, my name is Yi, and today we'll be talking about wrong division, secure multi-party quantum computation with identifiable board. This is a joint work with my advisor Kai Min, and with my friends and colleagues Bar, Hao, Mi Ying, and Yu Xing. So, let's start with multi-party quantum computations. So, here we have n parties, and the goal is for them to jointly compute the quantum circuit. So, this circuit takes n inputs, so one from every one from every body, and it also has an output, so one for every one. So at the beginning, every party holds their private inputs, and then they run some protocol. So they exchange some messages that can either be quantum or classical, and then at the end of the computation, every party gets their own output. A common security notion is called security with a board, which uh intuitively means that uh, everyone learns only their own output. Unless the protocol affords, in which case the honest the honest parties would not get any output. Okay, so Dupois, Nielsen, and Savile constructed such a protocol that, uh, that satisfies security with the board. And similarly, for this uh, more recent work by Dulek, Brillo, Jeffrey, Mahens, and Schaffner, and well, this security notion is good, but there's an obvious weakness is that a protocol may abort, particularly the adversary might choose to abort the protocol whenever it feels like, and when that happens, we call it a denial of service attack. It's also well known that this kind of attack cannot be prevented with the uh, with dishonest majority. And uh, like I mentioned, when it does happen, the honest parties get no output. But uh, because we are working under the quantum setting, there is an additional issue, which is that uh, all of the quantum inputs would be consumed and lost due to the no cloning theorem. So here, of course, a denial of service attack, like I mentioned, it cannot be prevented. Uh, but still, we want to ask, is there still anything we can do about this? It turns out the answer is yes because there's this other security notion called security with identifiable abort. So roughly, it means that uh, when the protocol aborts, everyone at least knows who to blame, so everyone knows who, who is causing the abort. So this notion was introduced by Ishai, Ostrovsky, and Zikas. And classically, it was satisfied by the GMW protocol, and their high-level idea is to use broadcast and ZK proofs so the honest party can prove to everyone that they did what they're supposed to do. But of course, now we are under a quantum setting, and we cannot broadcast a quantum state because there's again there's no cloning theorem, so broadcast does not work in quantum, and therefore it is unclear how to achieve security with identifiable abort from existing constructions that like I mentioned on the previous slide. And this is exactly our uh, contribution. So uh, our contribution is that we construct a protocol for computing any multi-party quantum circuit with identifiable board using this primitive. So the first primitive we use is the classical multi-party multi-party computation with identifiable board. And the other primitive we use is called a verifiable quantum full homomorphic encryption scheme, which was uh, proposed and constructed by Alastric et al. Okay, and it's also worth mentioning that our protocol is wrong efficient in the sense that the number of rounds in our protocol with quantum messages does not depend on the circuit. But I want to clarify that this does not mean we have constant rounds, because the uh, our number of rounds still depends on the number of other factors, such as one, the, not the wrong complexity of this, and two, the uh, number of parties, and three, the uh, security parameter that we choose. So we do not have constant wrong, as uh, opposed to this other concurrent work by Bartuset, Claude Benjolo, Kurana, and Ma. And in fact, this concurrent work is also presenting in this conference, and they have a constant wrong protocol for a uh, multi-party quantum computation, but they do not have identifiable reward. Okay. And the uh, last thing that is worth uh, mentioning about our protocol is that it is fair if the underlying classical NPC, if this thing is also fair. 
And uh, what we mean by fairness is that either everyone gets their output or nobody does, as opposed to the quote-unquote unfair situation, where the dishonest parties could potentially get their output first, and then they could uh, afford the protocol, so the honest party get nothing. Okay, so that is our contribution, and now let me show you how do we how do we make it happen. But uh, first of all, I want to identify a challenge that is specific to a quantum setting. It's actually just sending a quantum message. Just even when we are trying to send quantum messages, we already encounter issues related to identifiable words. So uh, let me just demonstrate. So let's say these parties are running a uh, running some protocol, and let's say player one is malicious. So uh, he's a bad guy. So he just uh, decides to withhold the message. So it's supposed to send a message to P2, but he does not send it. Okay. In which case, because there's no cloning, so this message is lost for good, and any information that has been stored in this message is also lost. So it is possible that we might not be able to recover from this uh, from losing this message, and in which case we might have to abort. Let's say that does happen, then well, we'll have to catch the malicious, we have to catch a bad guy. And well, okay, so let's take a perspective of P3 for a moment. So of course, from his perspective, he can say that player one is malicious for the reason I just mentioned, but he would not always be correct because there is always, there's also which other configuration where P1 is honest and P2 is malicious and P1 sends a message to P2, but P2, after receiving the message, he falsely accuses P1 and claims that the message was not sent. And well, from the perspective of P3, these two situations are indistinguishable. So P3 does not know which of player 1 and player 2 is malicious. And therefore, we just don't have enough information to get identifiable for in this particular case. So it almost seems like there's some kind of barrier to attend or to satisfy identifiable abort under a quantum setting. We cannot even send quantum messages without running into these issues. But well, we are able to overcome this barrier, of course. So let me uh, show you how how to solve this uh, problem. But before we solve it, let's uh, first uh, formulate it a bit better and actually make it well defined. Okay, so the goal is, like I said, that uh, player 1 wants to send a qubit to player 2 but uh, we want to send it in a way that is uh, secure with identifiable abort, meaning that if this process goes wrong, then we will then everyone will know who is the uh, cheater. Okay. So to make the discussion more effective, we are also going to put some restrictions on the adversary's power for now. So right now the adversary can still drop outgoing messages that I mentioned. So he's supposed to send a send a message, and he's not he's just not sending it. Or uh, the other attack, also I mentioned earlier, is that uh, maybe player two is malicious. Then he can take a message and then claim that it is not, it was not sent. And right now we worry only about these two attacks. Uh, there will be some other issues down the line, such as uh, privacy or authentication. But we'll worry about that later. Okay. So this is the uh, definition of this qubit sending problem that I'm about to solve. So now let's present. Let me present our solution, which is which we call routing. Uh, by the way, for this uh, demo, for purpose of this demo, let's just say these two are honest and these two are malicious today. Okay. So as you can tell, as you might be able to tell from name routing, this uh, our construction is inspired from computer networks. So when we talk about routing, then we are trying to route uh, something from player one to player two. We are trying to route packets. And well, here is how we create our package. So we tag the uh, input, the player one's original input, and we run a quantum error correcting code. We run a QECC on the input to create our package. The reason why we choose to use QECC is because uh, we, as in our discussion earlier, we cannot avoid losing messages. But uh, and that is why we can uh, we use ECC we use error correction. So even if we lose some of these packets, as long as most of these packets do arrive at P two, then he will still be able to to uh, to recover the original message just by de decoding the surviving packets that he's received. Even if we so even if we lose uh, some packets, as long as we don't lose too many, we are still okay. So that is our packet. And of course, uh, we also have to talk about our network that we are going to 
used in our routing uh, procedures. So the uh, we initialize the uh, our network as a complete graph between all of the players. Okay, so now the uh, we are going to route these packets from player one to player two. And well, of course, since there's a direct path here, then that is what we will try first. So we try to send these packets one by one from player one to player two along this edge until a packet gets dropped. Okay, if no packets gets dropped, then of course player two gets all of this and he can just decode it easily and we'll be done. So right now, let's just say player two does this attack over here and now we lost a message. We lost a packet. And uh, well, right. And we are still fine because we are using ECC, so again, we can afford losing a packet. And now we know this edge is unreliable, so we get rid of it. We erase it. And then, just like how routing usually goes, we find a different path. So right now we find this path, and we try to send the remaining packets along this path. Here I want to make a remark that uh, this, this edge is uh, between two other parties, so a packet would never get lost on this edge because uh, player 1 will always send it, send a packet, and player 3 will never falsely accuse him of not sending one. So for the purpose of this uh, this demo, let's just say the next uh, packet gets dropped here. In that case, we erase this edge, but we do not erase this one. So uh, generally, we only erase the packet, we only erase the edge where the packet drop actually occurs. And you know, the process just repeats itself. So next time we find this edge and we find this path and then we try to send the uh, remaining packets along this path. I'm sure well there are two uh two two conditions where the protocols could end. The first condition is if P1 has no packets left, so everything has been sent. And uh, or the other uh, condition is that uh there might be no path exists from P1 to P2, in which case P1 can would not be able to send the uh whatever packet he has left. Okay? So uh, let's talk about the first situation first. So P1 has no packets left, then meaning that the uh, everything has either been uh, received by P2 or has been lost somewhere in the uh, in lost in transmission <laughs> has been dropped. Okay, so uh, in this case, we actually have an upper bound on the uh, packet loss, which is just the number of edges. Because uh, recall, every time we lose a packet, we remove an edge. So of course, we cannot lose more packets then we have edges so we have this upper bound and this upper bound actually uh, corresponds directly in to the number of errors in this uh, error correcting code in this QECC and therefore since we have an upper bound on the uh, number of errors therefore if the uh, if this were set up correctly uh, accordingly to the uh, to that upper bound players who would always be able to decode the original message just from the uh, surviving packets so that is kind of the uh, correctness property of our construction for for this case. So now, uh, for this second case, let's say there's no path exists from player one to player two. Then of course the protocol will have to abort. So let's uh, make it happen. So now let's say this uh, this path gets broken and this also gets broken. And here I claim that we always have identifiable abort. And let me uh, let me explain why okay so i'm gonna state a couple facts a couple observations so the first observation is the graph is uh, disconnected uh when this happens uh because well no path exists from one player to another let me that of course just gives us this uh right away and disconnected it's disconnected in the sense that uh, the graph is made up of more than one connected components okay so that's fact number one and then uh, the other fact I want to state, again, okay, it's also an observation I made earlier, is that uh, edges never break between other parties. Okay, so, and this fact number two actually implies fact number three, is that the other parties are on the same connected component. Okay, and lastly, fact number one and three together will give us uh, identifiable abort, because the honest parties, who again are on the same connected component, they can just agree to blend everyone else on different connected components. And that will give us identifiable board. So that is our construction. And that is our solution to this qubit sending problem. 
uh, again, uh, we are putting some restrictions on this adversary. So here I also want to make a quick remark that uh, to deal with general adversary behavior, uh, authentication code will help. But uh, as for how exactly does it help, well, I I will explain it. Uh, I will explain it later in this presentation. But uh, for now, let's just uh, take this uh, construction of routing and let's try to build a multi-party quantum computation protocol from this uh, from ideas that we get from routing. Okay, so the uh, the first step towards doing that is uh, I'm just gonna give a quick rundown on the uh, on how the existing constructions are built. So as a really rough sketch, there are usually uh, three phases. So there's encryption, there's evaluation, and there's decryption. Okay, so let's talk about encryption first. Okay, so the encryption phase, it is a. Uh, if you are familiar with existing constructions, it corresponds to uh, the first, uh, maybe first half or just first couple steps of only the first couple steps of what's commonly called input commitment or input encoding. But anyway, so uh, let me actually describe what it does. So yeah, uh, so the goal of encryption is to encrypt every party's input using quantum authentication code. Okay, so and here I say encrypt because it's a known fact that quantum authentication implies encryption. So after this encryption phase, so everyone's input gets encrypted and now inputs are not protected in the sense that they are both encrypted and authenticated. So in other words, these inputs are now ready to be passed around between different parties. But we are not doing that yet. In the encryption phase, there's no quantum communications yet, even though there might be classical ones because the parties might come together and jointly generate the uh, encryption key for this uh, authentication code. And that is about it for encryption. So now let's move on to evaluation. So in evaluation phase, everyone just evaluates the uh, evaluates the circuit over the authentication code, and uh, of course it involves uh, quantum communications because at the end of the first phase, everyone holds their input, and we we'll have to make those inputs come together somehow. Okay, and at the end of the evaluation end of evaluation phase, everyone would hold a cipher text of their own output. And then decryption just does what you think it does. So it just everyone de decrypts their output and go home with it and be happy and be done. Okay, so that is uh that is how the uh, existing constructions go. Uh, again, this is just a really rough sketch. But let's see how does routing fit into this picture. Well, the first question we want to ask is uh, of course uh, can we just incorporate routing into existing constructions and get identifiable aboard? So here's what I mean uh, as a candidate protocol. So we keep the encryption phase the same because it's local, it doesn't really need routing. And then in the evaluation phase, every time we are supposed to send a quantum message, we call the routing subroutine to send all the, uh, so for every quantum message, we just send it using the routing subroutine. Okay, and well, does this construction work? The uh, answer is, well, unfortunately not. And the, uh, a uh, really uh, high level reason is that the uh, QECC would destroy the authentication. So here's what I mean. So we call that this is authenticated. Uh, so and the purpose of, of authentication is to prevent the uh, malicious parties from tampering with the underlying plain text. But then when we take the uh, QECC of authenticated code word, then the individual packets are not authenticated anymore. So when we try to call routing on this uh, packet, then this packet can actually be tempered by relays. Uh, when I say relays, I mean it. I mean it in the routing sense, as in the uh, the parties that get to touch the uh, packets between the uh, sender and the receiver. Okay. So the answer to this question is no. There are many reasons why this is no, but and this is one of the uh, main reasons. Okay. And uh, but still, from this uh, from this no go result, we still get some insight out of this situation. Namely, that the uh, each of the packet will have to be protected separately. So why don't we just try to switch these two steps and see what happens? So here we try to first do QECC 
and then we encrypt. So now every uh, QCC code word is protected. Every packet is protected. Okay, so now the uh, one of the reasonable, I guess, uh, yeah, one of the natural strategies to test is to just homomorphically evaluate the QECC. So we are evaluating both over QECC and over authentication code. And everyone still get their output, and then everyone just decodes uh, locally and get their output. So everyone decodes both encryption and QECC after the computation is done here. Okay, so this looks promising, but unfortunately this still does not quite work. So we actually have a concrete attack against this construction. Okay, so we call this an invalid QECC attack. So the idea is that this QECC can be prepared incorrectly because it is prepared by dishonest parties. At least some of them are. So uh, the dishonest parties can just prepare this as garbage. And then, well, we know what they say, garbage in, garbage out. So this is now also garbage and it decodes garbage. And uh, I will give a simple example to demonstrate. So take this circuit, for example. So this circuit, it has, of course, it's two steam updates. Uh, I, one of the ways to look at this circuit is uh, just that it takes two inputs, and then it takes the XOR of the two inputs, and it writes the result on the last, uh, on this MCR. And now, let's try to run this circuit under the, uh, under repetition code, and see what happens. And of course, we know that uh, repetition code is not fully homomorphic, but it is good enough for us to, for me to, uh, to demonstrate this attack. So let's, let's go. So zero under repetition code, it gets repeated three times. So it goes to this. And these two are not real code words of a uh, repetition code. And now, uh, under repetition code, if you want to do a C not, you just apply to every, uh, to every qubit. So, this goes to this, it does not change. This does goes to this, again, it does not change. And this, after this two C not, goes to this. So this is the uh, result. And now we, we, uh, decode the, uh, we decode the repetition code, which is just by taking a majority vote. So this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and this goes to one. So this result is saying that the XOR of zero and zero is one, which is not correct, obviously. So, here we have inconsistent outputs, and this will break the correctness of uh, of multi-party computation, and therefore this construction is again no go. Uh, but uh, still, we can try to fix this attack and maybe get a working construction out of it, and this is exactly what we did. So this is our construction. The difference between this and the previous slide is, of course, this middle part. So what we do here is that we decode QECC here. So we combine the package before we evaluate the circuit. And this will fix the attack that we had because, well, even if this were invalid, then we can also just, we can always just handle it here and we end up with something valid here. So we are always evaluating over valid inputs. Okay. So this construction, it has caveat is that, well, we cannot communicate after decoding QECC because this is not in packet form. So we cannot, we can no longer send any messages. Okay. And if we cannot communicate, then it sounds like a job for a very, very, very viable quantum for quantum FHE. And that is what we ended up using. So, uh, to sum everything up and to fill in the gap, let me just, uh, go through our protocol step by step. So every, everyone start with their own input. They first create packets out of their own input and then they protect the packets each of the packets. And then they route this packet to what we call a server, which is just one, which is just a designated party. It doesn't matter who gets to be a server. We can always say that player one the server. Okay. And then the server, he uh, locally combines these packets and apply the circuit to get everyone's uh, output. And then he creates packets out of everyone's output. And then after that, he routes everyone's output back to, to where it's supposed to go. And then the parties, once they receive this, they can just, uh, decrypt it and decode it to get their own output. Or at least this is the, uh, really high level summary of our protocol, just a sketch. And, uh, there's a lot of very interesting issues that we are brushing under a rock here, unfortunately, due to the, uh, 
due to time constraints. So I really, really encourage you to read our paper to get a more complete treatment on this. Okay, so uh, now to uh, to summarize, we uh, we construct the uh, the first multi-party quantum commutation protocol with Python 5 over 4. And it's also worth, and again, our uh, protocol is run efficient and it preserves the fairness from the uh, classical MPC that we use. In terms of future work, one of the uh, direction is to require more dishonest parties to close the board. So here's what I mean. In our protocol, because we use a server, so let's say if a server, if a server were malicious, then he can just take, you know, he can just take everyone's input and then he just goes home with it. And then the protocol will have to abort because everyone has lost their input. And that takes just one dishonest party to do to close the board, namely a server. So now, uh, so we are wondering if there's a better construction that can tolerate more honest, tolerate more dishonest parties before the protocol has to abort. Okay. So that is one of the open problems. And the, uh, the other open problem we have is that we are wondering about the possibilities for getting a constant run multi-party quantum computation with identifiable board. So here's what, what we mean. So uh, we are wondering if it's possible to get this and this at the same time. So of course we've accomplished this and there's the other work that uh, we have and there is work that uh, that achieves this. But then we are wondering if it is possible to get both at the same time. And right now our construction is not concerned wrong because routing is a bottleneck because we need to route the uh, packet one by one uh, to to all the uh, parties, to different parties. So right now, and right now we're suspecting that it might be impossible to uh, to get both of this, but uh, it's something worth thinking about. So uh, thank you very much. And that is all I have.